Um, Victoria. Um, sorry. Um, sorry. Stop. Stop it telling me I'm being recorded. Um, thanks very much. Um, uh, as Victoria said, this is a kind of IPUP seminar, and a lot of what we've had have been quite definitely public history papers this year. This one's sort of slightly more at the kind of memory studies sort of end of it, I would say. Um, but then I think that's okay because IPUPs always always aim to have quite a broad remit and to be concerned with all sorts of approaches to the ways in which people in society um, relate to the past. Um, the other thing I'm gonna say at the start is the traditional thing that this is very much um, a presentation coming out of work in progress. And I mean that quite seriously because there are two very specific ways in which this is work in progress. One is that I haven't decided on any conclusions, so it's not gonna tie up neatly at the end. Um, and uh, the other is that I really haven't yet got as far as working out what ought to be in here and what ought not to be. So again, if it sprawls a bit, my apologies, I'm gonna throw quite a lot of different sort of ideas and bits of information um, at you and I'm really hoping that you will have um, thoughts uh, and questions that will kind of help me work out what I really ought to be doing with all of this stuff. Um, the research that I'm talking about uh, stands at a sort of intersection, if you like, between military history and social memory studies uh, and I approach that intersection, I guess, from a standpoint in what you might call organisational studies. So basically what I'm interested in is the workings of memory within organized uh, or institutional human communities. So that could be you know, businesses or churches or universities or political parties. Uh, but in this case, this evening, I'm gonna be looking specifically at military organizations and uh, in particular um, at British army uh, regiments. Um, during the period from roughly the 1880s to the 1960s, and I'll explain the period in a, in a minute. Um, and to make it even more specific, the information that I'm going to be drawing on comes from three regiments in particular, which I put up on screen there. And as you can instantly see, they are all Lancashire regiments. So it's narrow in several ways. Um, but what I hope is that the material um, that I'm going to introduce will raise some issues that will be relevant, not just to the study of memory cultures in other kinds of military formation, but to organizational memory studies more generally. These regiments, as you see, um, occasionally change their names, but I'm just gonna call them the East Lancashire Regiment, the South Lancashire Regiment, and the Loyal North Lancashire Regiment. Loyal is not a label that I stick on them, it's part of their regimental name officially. Um, so military memory uh, is uh, an enticing um, field uh, for investigation for social memory studies, I think, for two uh, main reasons, I guess. Firstly, military organizations um, often have uh, highly developed and distinctive memory cultures embedded in rich and abundant funds of um, ritual material culture, textual and visual representation, symbolism and oral tradition. And these memory cultures serve both to imbue the members of the organization with a lively sense of the corporate heritage on which their shared identity in the present is assumed to be founded, and also to stake the organizational community's claim to recognition and indeed to honor within the larger society. Uh, by connecting it to the larger histories, usually of the nation, uh, and in the case we're considering today, also of the British Empire. And then secondly, by virtue of those kind of symbolic connections, but also because of the ways in which military communities are recruited from and embedded within the larger structures of society, military memory cultures continuously intersect with other social memory frames, notably those of family, class, and local community. So military memory is a sort of prism that we can use for exploring aspects of social memory more generally. Now, uh, forms um, of military organization um, vary, of course, from country to country, um, but for the British case, at least for the period I'm thinking about today, regiments are what we're dealing with. They're the most obvious institutional containers of military memory. 
um, the regimental system was regarded in this period by its admirers, but also by its less numerous detractors as the key distinguishing feature of British military organization. So most soldiers performed their military service wholly or largely within a particular regiment, and they were identified uh, by themselves, by the army and by society in terms of that regimental belonging. Regiments were the primary focus of military symbolism uh, and tradition expressed through distinctive details uh, of uniform insignia, ceremony, music, and etiquette. This, I promise you, is the only cap badge slide in the whole presentation, I think, uh, but you can't do military history without having a cap badge slide. So uh, here it is. This is new recruits to the South Lancashire Regiment in 1935 being solemnly instructed in the meanings of the regimental cap badge, including its history. Um, regiments were also um, the principal institutional accumulators um, through their officers and sergeants' messes, and latterly through regimental museums, like the one um, shown here, um, of the kinds of relics and memorabilia that students of military memory may wish to analyze. So basically, regiments and county regiments in particular are the containers of memory that I'm going to be examining. Now, in organizational terms, we're looking here at a particular phase in the development of the British regimental system. And that phase was initiated by a thing called the Childers Reform in 1881, which is the reform that brought each of our three regiments and a whole load of other regiments uh, into being uh, as separate regimental entities. Um, and they remain in that shape through until the post Second World War period when there's a further round of military restructuring, which recombines these Childers era regiments into a smaller number of regimental structures, as you can see at the bottom of the page here. These three all land up eventually as part of something that's called the Queen's Lancashire Regiment, which has subsequently been, been absorbed into a larger thing, which is nowadays called the Duke of Lancaster's Regiment. So you don't have to remember all of that detail. That's you know, just so that I've done the organizational bit. So my reasons um, for, so yeah, so just, just to kind of gloss that. So we're talking about the British Army regiments that really fight the Boer War, the First World War, the Second World War, and that are in place as part of the British Army through from the heyday of the British Empire to its eventual um, uh, disintegration. Um, now, why focus on these three Lancashire regiments in particular? Um, well, I'm afraid my reasons are extremely um, pragmatic and they're largely COVID related. Um, one effect of the mergers of the 1950s and 60s that I've just talked about was that these regiments, their, their museum collections, their, their regimental collections, which had once been separate, get combined in this place, the Lancashire Infantry Museum in Fullwood Barracks uh, in Preston. Now, like other regimental museums, this one, of course, has been closed to researchers during the pandemic. But fortunately for me, unlike most other museum, regimental museums, it had previously made the complete run of its regimental magazines collections available in digital form uh, for purchase. So for something like 60 quid, I think it was, I've been able to get a source that I could actually work on, uh, you know, from my own sitting room, essentially. Um, and that's basically what I've done for the last year in terms of research. And it's what this um, presentation this evening uh, is based on. So this is a piece of research uh, that has its roots in kind of scoping work that I and my colleagues, Katrina Kennedy and Jasper Heinzen did several years ago. And at that stage, we were really envisaging approaching regimental memory principally through the material holdings of regimental museums. What I've tried to do uh, in this phase of it is just to sort of flip that round, come in via regimental magazines and see what I can get out of just basically using that source uh, intensively. So what follows is gonna be in two parts. Uh, in the first part, I'm gonna say a bit more about the complex uh, parameters as I see them of British Army regiments as memory communities using our three Lancashire regiments 
uh, as my example. And I say as an example, because I'm not really going to be distinguishing a lot between those three regiments. I'm just drawing on all three of them. And then the second part, I'm going to focus more specifically on memory content and on what regimental magazines can tell us about memory activity within these regiments. Okay, so what does it mean to envisage uh, a regiment as a memory community? Well, I think like most other kinds of durable, organized human communities, regiments need to be understood on two levels simultaneously as functioning institutional frameworks and as transgenerational imagined communities. Uh, so the institutional structures of regiments as they exist at any given moment, obviously exert uh, an influence on the framing of memory within the organization. But memory formation is also influenced by the conception that soldiers have and are institutionally strongly encouraged to have of the regiment as a transgenerational community uh, whose present members at any given moment are the co-inheritors and the presumptive co-extenders, if you like, of long established corporate traditions. Now, part of the complexity of regimental memory in the period that I'm considering uh, stems from the fact that although the Childers reform of 1881 created substantially new regimental structures, it didn't create these new regiments out of nothing. What Childers basically did was take existing line infantry regiments, which were traditionally identified by number, and power them up as sister battalions within the new regimental structures. So for example, as you can see there, the 30th and the 59th regiments of foot became in 1881, the first and second battalions of the newly formed East Lancashire Regiment and something similar happens for the two other regiments. Um, and the important point here, the reason I'm laboring this is that elements of memory and tradition adhering to these antecedent regiments remain an important point of reference in shaping post childers regimental identities. So right through the first half of the 20th century, soldiers in many regiments continued to refer to the regular battalions of those regiments by their pre-1881 regimental numbers. And they maintained an emotional uh, and also often a formal ceremonial connection to those earlier regimental histories. So for example, uh, Tarifa Day, um, uh, evoking the heroic exploits of the old 47th Regiment at Tarifa in the Peninsula War, remained a key date in the commemorative calendar of what had become the Loyal North Lancashire Regiment's 1st Battalion. So the kind of temporal horizons of memory uh, go, go beyond the current organizational forms. That's the basic point I'm trying to make. Second point I want to make concerns local affiliation. So an important aim of the Childers reform was to strengthen the local and regional basis of military organization. So the new regiments were not just nominally connected to different parts of Britain, in this case to Lancashire, but they were anchored geographically by being given base depots and designated recruiting areas within those regions. Now, by the 1950s, the connections of regiments to local communities would come to seem, to, to seem axiomatic. They'd be taken for granted. It was assumed that regimental identity and local identity kind of played off each other and reinforced each other. But that can't be taken for granted from the outset. Actually, only one of the six antecedent regiments that were brought together in 1881 to form our three supposedly Lancashire regiments had any real prior connection to Lancashire uh, as a county. So they get Lancastrianized over time. Um, and that's partly down to the new recruiting structures that I mentioned, and to another reform that annexes previously separate local militia uh, and volunteer units to the new regimental structures. But it also reflects kind of sustained collaborative memory work over several decades by regimental, ecclesiastical, and civic authorities, all working together in towns like Preston, Warrington, Blackburn, and Burnley, soldering regimental and local identities together through the siting of war memorials, location of regimental chapels in local churches, 
granting civic freedoms to regiments and things like that. And that's what you can see the sort of lineup of dignitaries of church, state, um, local authority, um, uh, and regiment uh, on a Remembrance Day parade there in Warrington at the bottom of, of the slide. Uh, above all, though, this kind of soldering of the links with local community reflected the increased mobilization of locally recruited men uh, through the new regimental structures uh, um, for the purposes of modern warfare. And the kind of tragic apogee of that, if you like, comes with the hyper-localized uh, recruitment and correspondingly locally devastating casualty rates uh, of First World War service battalions, otherwise known as PALS battalions, like the Accrington PALS um, here. But actually the, the pattern was set before that with the Boer War of 1899 to 1902. And to symbolize that, I just wanna give one example. Here is the Boer War Memorial um, in Warrington's Queen's Gardens inaugurated in 1902. And it's topped, uh, no, sorry, 1907, as you can see there. And it's topped by the heroic statue of a man called Colonel McCarthy O'Leary, who had been killed in action leading the 1st Battalion of the South Lancashire Regiment in a decisive assault at Peters Hill on the road to Ladysmith in the Boer War in 1900. Um, and crucially, he was killed allegedly at least with the exhortation to his men, remember the eyes of Lancashire are on you today, fresh on his lips. So that memorial and um, the Kimberley Memorial in Preston, which you can see in the background here, which commemorates the loyal North Lancashire's role in the defense of Kimberley, took on a kind of significance, both in civic and in regimental commemorative calendars that the First and Second World Wars supplement, but don't um, efface. And what you can see here are the last few loyals Boer War veterans still staggering along in the Kimberley Day Parade in 1965 with a bit of help from younger members of the regiment. So connections to earlier regimental traditions and connections to local community are, are both important um, in shaping uh, regiments as communities of memory. But equally important are the shifting relationships between currently serving and retired soldiers. So uh, in 1870, the normal term of military service was reduced from 21 years to 12 years, half of which was usually served uh, on the reserve. Um, so that has a number of effects. It means that soldiers are um, the, the period over which soldiers are sort of intensively socialized within the regiment is reduced. The opportunities for intergenerational exchange of memory between serving soldiers are reduced. And the numerical balance between um, serving members of the regiment and former, i.e. retired members, um, is, is shifted. Um, so from that moment on, sustaining a kind of transgenerational flow of regimental memory comes to depend increasingly on cultural institutions like regimental museums and regimental magazines, um, uh, and also on the institutional strengthening of links between the regiment and its former members through things like old comrades associations. The other thing that happens, of course, is that the massive wartime expansions of regimental recruitment in the First and Second World Wars and the equally dramatic post-war contractions of that expanded wartime regimental labor force uh, pose a further set of challenges because they create for the first time a situation in which the still living former members of regiments heavily outnumber those who are still serving but in which most of those still living former members had only memories of wartime service themselves and didn't have any real identification with the slower rhythms of, of a peacetime uh, army. So regiments often actually struggle to bind those different groups, those different cohorts together in a coherent memory community. But in a different way, um, mass wartime military service did extend the horizons of regimental memory uh, as regimental kind of records of honor, which had previously been focused essentially on the lengthy fighting records of long service regular battalions had to be expanded to accommodate 
heroic actions by battalions that were largely composed of wartime citizen soldiers, like uh, the sixth, sorry, I think it's the sixth Lyles, not the seventh Lyles, um, uh, heroic defense of the Diyala River bridgehead in Mesopotamia in 1917, which we can see uh, a, a contemporary impression of here, and also the memorial erected on the site afterwards. The final factor that I want to draw attention to uh, in mapping regiments as memory communities during this period is the role of family. Now, talk of the regiment itself as a family was a kind of common device of paternalistic rhetoric during this period. But it also reflected a, a reality in which, for many soldiers, memories of regimental life were interwoven with actual family members and traditions. So in regimental literature, children who are born to serving uh, soldiers are said to be born into the regiment. And any of those who later enlist in the ranks themselves are called chips of the old block. Um, Thomas McNamara, who served briefly as Lloyd George's Minister of Labor after the First World War, um, who was somebody who had been born into the Loyals antecedent, one of the Loyals antecedent regiments in 1861, recalled his own experience, as you can see here. He says he was born in the regiment nearly 60 years ago, and his early boyhood was spent in its barrack rooms, insisting on being told over and over again the story of Balaclava, the Alma, various other actions in the Crimean War. My earliest guides, he says, philosophers and friends, were the non-commissioned officers and men of the old 47th Regiment. The Lancashire Lad, which is the name of the Loyal's Regimental Magazine, in 1936 listed the fathers and grandfathers of 27 so-called chips of the old block currently serving in the regiment. And those included, for example, a man called Company Sergeant Major Grafton, whose grandfather, father, uncle, three brothers and cousin, as well as himself, had all served in the same regiment. Um, Another guy, Sergeant Major William Sullivan, who died in 1933, he counted six generations and two centuries of family connection to the South Lancashire Regiment and its antecedents. He'd been born to the regimental schoolmistress in 1856. Uh, he'd served in the regiment with his brother. His son had served in it. The husbands of both his daughter and his granddaughter had served in it. And we can switch to the female side. When, when widow Isabella White uh, presented her husband's medals from the 1880s to the East Lancashire's Regimental Museum in 1949, the Regimental Journal recalled that she was the daughter of a regimental recruiting officer and one of four sisters, all of whom had married non-commissioned officers of the 1st Battalion. So there are loads of examples of those kinds and the magazines are full of them. They're constantly reporting these kinds of family connection. Okay, so much then for the sort of social frameworks uh, within which uh, regimental memory cultures took shape. So what about the cultures themselves? Uh, I've got a kind of crude conceptual starting point thinking about this. I tend to think of regimental memory cultures as consisting of uh, practices and constructions that are arrayed, uh, as it says on the left here, on a kind of spectrum from the more or less formal and official to the more or less personal and uh, informal. At the formal end of the spectrum within any regiment, we have what I slightly flippantly call the regimental glory story. Uh, so the officialized record of the regiment's heroic action that we find um, encapsulated um, in um, things like uh, the, the, the battle honours on, on the regimental colours, the regimental flag, um, or as we see here on the cover of this regimental magazine, or in anniversary celebrations of battles in which the regiment has participated, or in the pages of official histories. So the glory story composes a running narrative of the regimental past that is highly selective, relentlessly positive, intentionally inspirational and overwhelmingly concentrated on battlefield and wartime heroism. It doesn't say much about peacetime. At the other end of the spectrum, um, we have the more piecemeal informal memories that individual soldiers at any given moment in a regiment's history 
derive from their own experience of soldiering, both in peace and in war. So these are often mundane memories of people, places, events, friendships, routines, workaday conditions, travel, sport, there's lots of sport, uh, eating and drinking, adventure, danger, hardship, boredom, etc. Sometimes kind of tinged with, with bitterness and resentment and tension, but more often, on the face of it at least, laced with humor or nostalgia. So memories of this kind are kind of transmitted conversationally or anecdotally. They are the stuff of what Jan and Elida Asman in their work on, on cultural memory have called communicative memory, much of which kind of evaporates quickly or remains private or personal, although some of it gets kind of caught up in the meshes uh, of memory culture and preserved at least for a time. But um, if we put the glory story in its developed forms at one end of the spectrum and the mundane play of personal reminiscence at the other, it pretty quickly becomes clear, I think, that this is too stark uh, a dichotomy really to get away with. Um, the very determination of regimental authorities to ensure the maintenance and propagation of a healthy sense of corporate tradition in the regimental workforce ensured that kind of great doses of heroic narrative are worked into the mundane textures of military experience. Sorry, that's an awful mixed metaphor. You can't weave a dose into a, into a texture, I don't think. But anyway, operating and mediating then between the more formalized articulations of heroic history and the workaday formulations of everyday memory we find a wide range of cultural and institutional practices that in one way or another help to foster in soldiers the kind of sense of living their lives as part of a transgenerational memory community. And these are really kind of more the, you know, where my interest is focused. So, so a comprehensive study of regimental memory processes would consider, for example, the ways in which parade ground drill, military music, and other ceremonial elements work to develop an almost kind of instinctual embodied awareness among soldiers of participating in an inherited pattern of symbolically charged performance. Would consider the ways in which details of uniform and insignia like the cap badge we saw carry kind of coded messages about regimental identity. It would consider regimental cultures of remembrance, which I'll say a bit about in a moment. It would also consider the ways in which regimental officers' messes and um, sergeants' messes or other NCOs' messes functioned simultaneously as, on the one hand, social and domestic spaces, but on the other hand, through their furniture and fittings, artwork, silverware, and social ritual as incubators and reminders of regimental tradition. Uh, anybody who's heard me speak about this before knows I always put in this example. This is one example among many. This is the Maida tortoise. Um, the tortoise was unfortunate enough to have been picked up on the battlefield of Maida in Italy at the end of a hard day's fighting in 1806, fighting by the, the regiment, not by the tortoise probably, and was fed uh, as dinner, unfortunately, to the commanding officer of the 81st Regiment who kept the shell as a sort of souvenir and later, after becoming a general himself, had it fitted out in silver and presented it to the officers of his old regiment as a snuff box uh, for use in the mess. So as a kind of reminder, both of the general's association with the regiment and of the regiment's role in the battle. And that passes eventually down into the loyal North Lan uh, Lancashire regiment because it becomes one of the battalions of that regiment. Um, a comprehensive review of regimental memory processes would also consider the naming of things, so the ways in which barracks and training companies and things like that get given names that evoke regimental history, peninsula barracks and so on, and also the construction of functional war memorials in the form of things like gymnasia or cottages for retired soldiers. All of these things kind of write memory into the topography and the built environment and the institutional furniture of regimental life. Such a study would also consider the role of 
uh, public historical performances and reenactments. Part of the army's PR, uh, but which also, I argue, had a role in reinforcing regimental identity for serving soldiers. So this is one example. We can see here soldiers of the South Lancashires at a military tattoo staged by the regiment for the citizens of Warrington in 1926, reenacting the capture and defense of the farm of La Essente at Waterloo, in which one of their antecedent regiments had participated. And I just want to give you this passage from the Warrington Gazette, which reports what follows on from this, this tableau, uh, because it links up different episodes in regimental history. So between the flashes of vivid light, gallant figures in the uniforms of the period are seen fighting their way to the victory, which gave their regiment fame. Under the smoke of battle, the scene changes for one more intense. Flanders of the great war years, amid the deafening cracks of cannon and various other sound effects, khaki clad men of the regiment can be seen in the trenches displaying the same spirit as their comrades at Waterloo. As a grand finale, groups of soldiers representing various periods from 1742, which is when the antecedent regiment, regiment had been created, march shoulder to shoulder with the soldiers of today. So the young soldiers of the 1920s who are performing that spectacle are kind of acting out the continuities of regimental history, acting out their own connection, both to their recent and to their more distant regimental predecessors. Finally, um, this is where we come on to the magazines, uh, a, a comprehensive exploration of regimental memory cultures would consider uh, more directly, as I want to do in the, in the remaining bit of this paper, the role of regimental magazines. Now, the earliest of these magazines date from around the 1880s, and they existed in most regiments by about the 1920s. Um, they usually appear on a quarterly footing. They tend not to appear in wartime, so they're essentially peacetime things. Um, and they offer a varied resource for military social historians, mixing regular reports on the activities of the regiment's component battalions at home and overseas, with articles on regimental and military history, autobiographical reminiscence, um, features on sport and travel, news of former members, letters, obituaries, photographs, comic artwork, jokes, anecdotes, etc., etc. Their importance for the study of regimental memory is twofold, really. Firstly, these magazines deliberately set out to report on the full range of regimental activities. So their purpose, as one editor who is quoted here put it, was to establish a record of the ordinary things of the regiment, which would complement the traditional heroic narratives by ensuring that, quote, such splendid achievements as the production of Aladdin and the success of the battalion in the Central India Boxing Tournament would have some chance of being remembered for posterity. So again, these magazines are a sort of prism through which we can look at regimental memory making in all its sort of multifaceted, but often quite mundane uh, diversity. But secondly, since these magazines were also set up with a view to developing and maintaining communications and fellow feeling between the different component parts of what is often called the regimental family. So between the depot, the HQ and the battalions, between those serving at home and overseas, between full-time soldiers in the regular battalions and part-time soldiers in territorial battalions, and between the retired members of the regiment and the currently serving ones. So these magazines are themselves, I want to argue, very actively and self-consciously instrumental in the construction and maintenance of regiments as memory communities, and they need to be understood as agents in that process. So let me give just a few more examples of some of the things that regimental magazines kind of give us glimpses of. Uh, both into memory making in action and into their own role in that process. So it's from regimental magazines that we get regular reports of the birthdays of old stagers like these guys, Thomas Costello and Enos Holloway, who were the last regimental survivors uh, in their regiments of the Indian Mutiny and the Maori Wars, respectively. It's from the magazines that we get 
glimpses of low level memory work, both within and around the regiment by a variety of agents. So it might be the regimental association who everyone goes to with their association um, secretary who everyone goes to with their queries about regimental history. Or it might be a butcher at the barracks whose days off are spent scouring the auctions for photos with a regimental connection. Or there's one report of a former soldier whose fish and chip shop outside the barracks in Preston was frequented by depot staff and recruits, quote, not only for the fish, but for the much useful information about the regiment. Or it might be here on the left, someone like Lady Francis Lady Dasbury, widow of a local landowning and industrial family who sponsored an essay prize on regimental history for local school children in Warrington. Or this guy, local alderman and mayor of Warrington, Arthur Bennett, uh, an enthusiastic amateur poet who wrote poems celebrating his town's regimental connections, as, as well, incidentally, as, uh, as, as a volume with the lovely title Songs of a Chartered Accountant, which I will one day try and catch up with. So all of these are kind of part of the, the sort of dense texture of regimental memory cultures that these magazines give us access to, impressionistic access, but I think it's cumulatively significant. So are the regular listings of accessions to the fledgling regimental museums that were taking place in all three regiments uh, in the interwar period. So accessions listings report the arrival of such mementos of the regimental past as a cannonball that had crashed into the tent of Major Farron of the 47th at the Battle of the Alma, or a portion of a hedge on the battlefield at Waterloo next to which the 30th Regiment had formed its defensive square against the French cavalry. There's a lot of elusiveness in the reports on this as to how big this portion of the hedge is, you know, whether it's several yards or a couple of tweaks. Um, <laughs> I need to get to the bottom of that one. Um, uh, or another, another relic is the Turkish bullet gouged out of Captain Wally Kelly's thigh in Mesopotamia in 1916, and presumably treasured thereafter. Regimental magazines also use photography as a means of connecting regimental past and present. So here's a group of veterans photographed at a regimental reunion, totaling 300 years of regimental service between them. And here are five generations of veterans from the Afghan war through to the post Second World War period captured at another reunion after the Second World War. Okay, uh, in, how much, what's the time? Does anyone give me a time? <laughs> Can I go on a bit? It's, it's quarter to seven, so uh, another five, ten minutes. Yeah, okay. So in that remaining time, I want to just highlight in a little more detail two other ways in which uh, regimental magazines can be seen as actively involved in sustaining and shaping memory in regimental circles. One is by promoting awareness of what I call the regiment's memorial diaspora. So regiments moving around the world for war uh, or on peacetime imperial service leave a kind of dispersed legacy of graves and memorials all over the place, uh, which range from enormous things on the Western Front to isolated graves. They include things like this plaque on the left, which simply commemorates the members of the regiment, including women and children who happened to die while the regiment was serving in a particular location. They include things like at the top, that's the grave of McCarthy O'Leary at Peters Hill, which we mentioned before. Uh, I'll skip the one on the bottom right. The one on the left is interesting because it reminds us really um, that the most harrowing days in regimental uh, history are not always days of battle. This is a memorial in an Irish churchyard or just outside one, I think, to a few of the several hundred men, women and children of two Lancashire antecedent battalions who had died in 1816 when the troop ships, uh, Bodicea and Seahorse, were wrecked off the coast of Ireland. Um, we can skip a few here. The point really about all of this is that regimental magazines are constantly gathering about this stuff. And it's not that individual members of the regiment must be assumed to know about all of these graves. The point really, I think, is that the action of regimental magazines in gathering and sharing this information helps to construct and reinforce this sense of the regiment as something that ought to be regarded as a memory community. 
Uh, secondly, shifting attention from formal and in sorry from the formal to the more informal personal expressions of memory. I want just to think a bit about how regimental magazines uh, tell us about cultures of communist co conversation and reminiscence, and to see how personal reflections draw on and feed into representations of the past on a more collective level. And again. The point here, regimental magazines are not just reporting things, they're actively promoting and facilitating a flow of reminiscence. So here we have a message from the editor of the Lancashire Lad, the, North, uh, the, the Loyal's regimental magazine, inviting uh, veterans to write in with incidents from their service that are treasured recollections. Don't bother, he says, to be a literary genius, just write it out for us in the vernacular as you would tell it in the barrack room or in the canteen, but not spitefully because people might not like that. Don't be afraid of being too fruity. And old soldiers respond in various ways. So some respond by sending in regular uh, kind of lengthy articles of reminiscence. Others resort to the letter columns and the letter columns of these magazines uh, often function virtually as sort of notice boards for soldiers, old soldiers seeking news of former comrades or trading uh, their halfpenny worth of reminiscence. So can any old comrade remember the tiger that broke up the orderly room? Uh, or do any of you remember the buffalo, the buffalo hunt where we were mistaken for the, the governor's party? Or here's one um, uh, from a veteran in the 1940s recalling service in Ireland in the 1890s, not forgetting Corporal Silversides, whom I have no doubt many of the old veterans will know and remember on account of his manner to the recruits who were in his squad and the stories that the old sweats in the depot used to tell to put the fear of God into the recruits by telling them what Corporal Silversides was likely to do to them. Um, so much of that is nostalgic. Um, old men recalling the comradeship and adventures of the past. Um, and much of it is humorous. So correspondents 50 years later, um, after the event, uh, relish the memory of a certain, certain bathing party at Worthing in 1905, when the tide came in too quickly and washed everybody's clothes away, and they had to be bundled naked into taxis to be taken uh, back to the camp. And if any of you have got experience at dealing with humor, anecdote, this kind of thing, uh, analytically, I'd really, it's one of the things I, I'm, I'm really trying to work on and would like to, to hear from. But there are also kind of starker notes that, that come into this sometimes. And I want just to fin finish with, um, if I can, just very, very quickly, three examples, which in different ways, I think, bring us back to the relationships between personal recollections and larger regimental memory structures. So the first example um, shows how formal and informal memory cultures could mesh together on a commemorative occasion. East Lancashire Regiment between the wars, Somme Day, the anniversary of the first day of the Somme, 1st of July, was the single most important and solemn commemorative date uh, in the official regimental calendar. Not surprisingly, because it was the day uh, which had seen the heaviest casualty rates in a single day in the regiment's history. Um, but it's also um, a day that as this report in the sergeant's mess notes in 1934 uh, reveals was an important occasion for sociability and reminiscence uh, with many old soldiers revisiting that battalion. It's quite common in the ante room to hear the older members talking about 95. And then we get tombstones, Sergeant Jepson to tell us of his greatest number of RIPs erected in one day. So the maintenance of regimental memory depends here on a mixture of ritual commemorative occasions and old soldiers' reminiscence. And this role of Sergeant Jepson as a kind of celebrity reminiscer, somebody whose memories, in this case of his deeply kind of lugubrious role as NCO in charge of the business of burying the dead, um, those memories are kind of actively solicited on these occasions. Second example going on very quickly also relates to the First World War. And it's an example of a recurrent regimental magazine genre, the military travelogue. In this case, we've got someone called uh, Company Sergeant Major Durkin, a regular contributor to the magazine, reporting in 1923 on a visit that he's just made to the battlefields 
uh, of the Aisne in France, where he had fought in 1914. What memories the names of villages recall to us as we pass through them, and he goes on. There are now two houses in Vendresse where the dressing station was. I remember a shell dropped right into the dressing station on the morning of 14th September 1914. The hedge in Vendresse, another hedge, where Sergeant Tom Singleton and Ginger Gunning were wounded is of course missing. And then a bit later, we stayed for a few minutes at the bend in the road above Troyon. The latter place consists of one wall now and a heap of grass grown ruins. I identified the spot where our old officer's mess was, where Captain Allison and Lieutenant Calro were killed at lunch. When this occurred, all the sergeants of HQ were having their dinner about 40 yards from the mess. And Durkin himself had been one of those sergeants. So this is a kind of exercise in kind of nemo topographical reportage, which is clearly drawing heavily uh, on Durkin's own vivid and micro localized memories of danger and destruction and using that to kind of turn the landscape into an aid memoir for the recollection of people and, and moments from the regimental past. And very finally, uh, my last example is a bit different. In 1894, 99 members of the 1st Battalion of the East Lancashire Regiment died of cholera at Lucknow and in the nearby sanitary station at Cochrane. So here's the monument to some of them in the graveyard at Cochrane which is part of that regimental memorial diaspora that I mentioned earlier. But the event was also commemorated in at least two fairly crude poetic uh, productions uh, of which I'd give you sort of edited highlights here. These were later reproduced in the regimental magazine. Oops, sorry. Um, and um, I think if one looks at them, they seem to be regimental in origin. And to me, at least, they seem to incorporate detail, which is personally remembered rather than merely invented. It is but 17 years, I remember well, that July morning in 94, we awakened to find that earth seemed hell, for the cholera fiend was attacking the core. The hurried gathering, the march away, the changing camps to elude the foe, and it goes on. On the morning of the 30th, the sad news was spread that Ashton and Smythe were both lying dead. We had a campfire to cheer the hearts of all, and one famous singer sang after the ball. Another was playing the accordion with great skill, but next morning we heard that they were both still I, dead. But while there's a lot in those verses that seems rooted in a culture of personal reminiscence, uh, of, of, you know, in a sense, quite a dramatic kind, the poets also apply rhetoric that seems to wish to assimilate the memory of the epidemic to the regimental heroic record. God bless them, the harassed, the sorely tried. That night the demon had drunk his fill of our splendid manhood, a regiment's pride, and found the survivors unconquered still. And recalling that disaster in 1939, the regimental magazine reported lots of tales of selfless devotion among those um, serving in the camps and concluded that it has been said that Cochrane 1894 was an occasion which brought as much honor to the regiment as any of the battle honors which appear upon the colors. Okay, I said no conclusion, um, so I'll leave it there, I, but I really would appreciate any kind of thoughts, advice, observations, comments on, on how I might kind of continue this exploration and make some kind of sense of it. Okay, thank you very much.